When Franco set up his first cabinet in the winter of 1937, it faithfully reflected the traditional forces of conservative Spain. It had four men from the new unified political movement, but only one of them had any connection with the pre-war revolutionary Falanque. There were two personal friends of Franco. There were four military men and two monarchists, including Pedro Sainz Rodriguez. He was supported by the army, but he took great care that the military men who entered the government would not take it over. What he presented was not exactly a military dictatorship, but a government of the Falahi and of the traditionalists. Nevertheless, the Falahi was just a sort of loincloth of his personal dictatorship. The genuine phalangists and traditionalists were prepared to do anything for the sake of their cause, so Franco could trust neither. Thus, the true party people were replaced with pseudo-phalangists and pseudo-traditionalists. And even they were gradually pushed aside, as Franco increasingly relied on the right-wing groups which, although they were not proper parties, supported him until the end of his life. We had absolute confidence in him. The Falanque wanted to run things and he sent them back. He wanted his brother-in-law to sort out the phalanx. He got rid of him too. He couldn't have cared less. His attitude was, I'm following the path I've set for myself. And that was that. And that's what he did. As his minister of public order, Franco appointed General Martina the Nido. This man's reputation was based on his brutal repression of anarchists in Barcelona in the 20s. Anido's appointment marked Franco's determination, above all, to strictly suppress any working-class resistance. If anyone was caught with any association with working-class parties or trade unions, they were summarily dealt with. Francisco Poyatas Lopez, a lawyer, had escaped assassination squads in Republican Madrid, but he found justice was no fairer in the nationalist zone. Entraban, por ejemplo, 20 individuos. Twenty people would go in and the trial would take less than a quarter of an hour. There wasn't even time for them to make statements, nothing at all. It was even worse than the executions without trial because on top of everything it was making a mockery of justice, giving an appearance of legality to something which was not legal at all. And also, as I learnt later on, Franco insisted that only one in five people could be acquitted. That was the highest proportion. The nationalist passion for the unity of Spain meant stamping on all aspirations for autonomy of the traditionally distinctive regions of Catalonia and the Basque Country. In the Basque Country, the physical devastation was matched with the attempt to destroy the spirit of Basque nationalism. The Basque language was prohibited. Even the road signs were painted out. In April 1938, as Franco's army was poised to invade Catalonia, he announced the abolition of the region's home rule. The decree proclaimed that Catalonia would now have the honor of being governed on an equal footing with the rest of Spain. Before the war was over, it became clear what that honor entailed. The so-called law of political responsibilities retrospectively made anyone who had been an active Republican for 18 months before the war liable to prosecution. It included anyone who resisted Franco during the war. More often than not, the sentence was death, even if it wasn't always carried out. By the spring of 1938, he was already rounding up thousands of Republican soldiers and sending them to concentration camps. And the war still had a year to run. <laughs> 